Welcome to the first mythology video of the year. Today is all about playing with infinity and the infamous axiom of choice to commit the perfect murder and to cheat death. Because I need the whole width of the screen for most of the video, you won't see much of me except now and at the end of the video. Bit of an experiment. Okay, so let's get started by imagining that you're an evil mastermind who wants to commit a perfect murder. It's all going to happen on this lively street just off the main street. And you know that at noon your victim, Batman, is going to walk down the street. You're going to use your infinitely many infallible assassins. You place the first assassin right here. As soon as Batman touches this line, this assassin definitely will kill him. Now just to make sure, you put a second assassin right here. And again, as soon as Batman touches this line, he'll die by the hand of this second assassin. And then you keep on going like this or put another assassin here, same rules and infinitely many more approaching this zero line but never reaching it. And now it's absolutely certain that once at 12 o'clock Batman crosses the zero line, he'll be dead. So that's pretty good but how is this the perfect murder? You can stop the video before the countdown is finished to try and come up with your own solution. So what makes this the perfect murder is that although Batman is definitely dead, we can also prove that none of the assassins killed him. So for example, assassin number one cannot possibly have killed him because to get to number one, Batman has to pass number two alive. And it's impossible because this guy is also infallible, definitely kill him. But then he'll never get to number two because he first has to get past number three, which is impossible. And number three is impossible and so forth. So that shows none of these guys killed Batman, but still he's definitely dead. Perfect murder, they should all go free. Which brings us to part two of this video, trial by hats. Okay, well the police is not that impressed to figure out what has happened. They don't really know how Batman died, but they know that somehow all of these guys were involved. So these guys are all found guilty of accessory to murder and are sentenced to death. Except they have a chance of walking free if they can answer a certain question correctly. For the questioning, the setup is like this. The infinitely many assassins get lined up like this. Then randomly zero or one hats get put onto their heads and they can look around. They can see all the other people's hats. The only thing they can't see is what number is on their own hat. And now at a certain time, they all have to shout out zero or one all at the same time. And whoever gets it right, walks free. We just have a look. Well, this guy walks free and that guy walks free and all of these guys walk free and the other guys who get it wrong get killed. Looks like it's a 50-50 chance for every single one of them, but the judge tells them, well, what you can do is you can get together the evening before and can try to come up with a strategy. And I'll just tell you, there is a strategy that will ensure that if you follow it exactly, only finitely many of you will get killed. One more thing, these assassins, they're not only infallible, but they're also terribly good at math. So actually they can do anything that mathematics can do. So for example, they can memorize infinitely many numbers or they can make infinite complex calculations, things like this. Again, you've got up to the end of the countdown to stop and ponder this. Here's the strategy. The infinitely many assassins get together and they list all possible infinite zero one sequences. And then they declare two zero one sequences close if they only differ in finitely many digits. So for example, these two sequences here are close because they only differ in those places here. So what that also means is that from a certain point on, the tails of these two things are the same. And now what they do is they bundle sequences together into boxes that if you take two sequences from different boxes, they will not be close. On the other hand, if you take two sequences from one box, they will be close. The reason why this actually works, why you can do this, lies in the fact that being close is something called an equivalence relation. And so those boxes are basically the equivalence classes. Don't worry about it, but you can think about why this is actually true, why you can do such a splitting up of the sequences. Anyway, we've done it now. And so what we do now is we pick out one sequence from each box and maybe label the box with it, okay? One from each box. And now what the assassins all do is they memorize these sequences. The memorized sequences now have a very special property and it's like this. If you take an arbitrary zero one sequence, 
there's exactly one among these memorized sequences that is close to the sequence. All other ones are not close, differ in infinitely many places. So these memorized sequences are now what we're going to use to get our strategy. Okay, short time. Next morning, everybody gets their head. And now the assassins just look around and basically they see everything except for one entry here, the one above their heads. And they can figure out now by comparing what they see to the memorized sequences that one memorized sequence that is close to what they see. And in this case, say it's this one here. And now the strategy is for every single one of the assassins to pretend that the memorized sequence is the real sequence. So the first assassin would say zero and he would walk free. The second guy would say zero but you know, tough luck, he gets killed. Third guy would say one, mm, tough luck, gets killed. But then from this point on, everything coincides and everybody else walks free. And in general, if you adopt this strategy, you can ensure that there's only finitely many assassins that get killed. Pretty neat, right? <laughs> but that's not the end of it. It's actually part three here, another puzzle for you. It's about cheating death. Well, actually, when you have a really, really close look, you ask yourself as an assassin, well, what does this strategy do for me? How much do my chances of surviving this improve? Well, before, without any strategy, it was obviously 50-50. And actually, when you have a really, really close look now, although we can guarantee that there's only finitely many assassins that get killed, the chances of every single one is still 50-50. That's not great. So assassins, you know, why would we bother with the strategy? So they just tell the judge we have to do better than that. Actually, the judge gets it and he says, okay, I'm going to change things a little bit. Why don't we do this? Instead of lining you up like this, I'm going to line you up like that. Everybody's facing now a certain direction. Then we get our heads and then this guy, for example, can see all of those heads. And this guy here can see all of those heads and this guy here can see all of those heads and so on. That seems more restrictive than before, but you know, wait for it, wait for it. Remember before everybody had to say their number simultaneously. This time, what you have to do is we kind of ask you one at a time. So we first ask this guy here and he says zero or one. He can't say anything else. He can't give anything else away, just zero or one. Okay. Everybody else can hear what he says. And then it's the second guy's turn. He says whatever he wants to say, zero or one. Everybody else hears it. And then it's this guy's term and so on. And now actually with this setup, and I'm just telling you guys, if you come up with the right strategy, you can actually ensure that pretty much everybody walks free. In fact, apart from the first one who still got his 50-50 chance, everybody, if you don't mess up, can walk free. So it's definitely worth pondering. And now again, I've got until my countdown ends to come up with a strategy. So here's a strategy. We're actually going to use exactly the same memorized sequences as before. So again, assassins can figure out which one of these sequences that they memorized is close to the one that's above them, because it just depends on the tail right, and their position in here. We all know this sequence. And now the strategy is again based on this memorized sequence. So what we do is, we just have a look at the first guy here. This guy now compares what he sees to the memorized sequence and just counts how many differences he sees. So he sees one difference here and one difference there. That's an even number of differences. So an even number of differences we say corresponds to a zero and odd number corresponds to a one. So he sees even, so he says zero. And he's also lucky he walks free in this way. So how does this now help the other people to figure out exactly what's on their heads. Well, let's have a look at the second guy. He knows that the one who just said zero saw an even number of differences. Now he only sees an odd number of differences. So what that means is there's got to be a difference in the spot that he's sitting in. So he knows that the memory sequence shows a zero. So there has to be a difference. That means there has to be a one on his head. And now I'll leave it to you to figure out how the third guy has to argue to figure out that there's a zero on his head and maybe do the details in the comments and just in general, what's the general strategy for N's guy here. And maybe what's also interesting, just in case one of these guys messes up, does this mean that other people are lost or not? So that was fun, right? <laughs> of course, since all this involves infinitely many assassins and those assassins performing superhuman infinite feats, <laughs> don't expect to see anything like this in the news anytime soon. On the other hand, in the world of pure mathematics, all this makes sense. 
Having said that, there's one aspect to all this that even makes some hardcore mathematicians uneasy. It's the bit where we've put all the infinitely many 0-1 sequences in those infinitely many boxes and then choose one sequence from each box. Here all the infinite sets and how we get them are not the issue. It's the picking of the sequence from each box that has raised mathematical eyebrows. It all sounds very innocent until you think about how you would actually accomplish this, even with all the powerful maths tools at our disposal. In this setup, there simply does not seem to exist a simple rule that can help us choose one sequence from each box. So what do I mean by this? Well, for example, if the boxes were each filled with positive integers, we could simply choose the smallest number in each box, right? So for example, here a 2, there a 1, here a 2. That would pin down things nicely. In this case, though, there does not seem to be any nice rule that could help. And for us to be able to make a choice in some fuzzy way anyway, requires us to accept the so-called axiom of choice within the canon of axioms that maths is based on. Informally, the axiom really just says that given any collection of non-empty sets, we can choose one element from each set. Now, what some mathematicians find problematic is that it is exactly the axiom of choice that makes some of the most mind-boggling, paradoxical and counterintuitive theorems of mathematics possible. The most famous example is the banach tarski paradox. It says that a solid ball can be split into finitely many disjoint sets, like this, which can subsequently be pushed and rotated around in space such that they recombine into two solid balls of exactly the same size as the one we started with. Pretty crazy, right? There's a great video by Vsauce about the banach tarski paradox, which is really a must-see for everybody here. Anyway, so should we accept the axiom of choice, given that it implies super paradoxical results like the banach tarski paradox? Well, it's our choice. And at least most mathematicians I know, including myself, subscribe to this axiom. And so what do you think about all this? Maybe leave your thoughts in the comments.